If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows. Comments and views expressed on The More Show are those of the people that make them and do not necessarily reflect the views of Kevin Moore, The More Show, or this radio station and its affiliates or sponsors. Hello and welcome to another edition of The More Show, which is sponsored by the Mindscape magazine. My guest today is Brian Foster. Now, Brian was born in the US, but moved to the west coast of Canada as a child, where he became immediately fascinated by the native traditions of people such as the Hydehurs. He learned to carve totem poles, canoes, masks, and other ceremonial things from master native carvers, and became a professional sculptor at 26 basically dropping his career as a marine biologist. He joins us now to discuss the history of the Incas and his research in Peru. Brian Foster, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Now, uh, you're based in Peru, aren't you? Yes, that's true. I'm, uh, I'm presently in Cusco. We just finished a, a tour with some people from uh, United Arab Emirates, um, but our, our base is in a small town just south of Lima on the coast. Okay, and what made you go all the way to sort of be based out in Peru and not to sort of look back or want to come back to Canada? Uh, well, actually, I started my study of, of uh, native indigenous cultures when I was a, a child in Canada on the West Coast. And I did that for a number of years, including becoming a professional totem pole carver at the age of 26. And I continued doing that until about the age 35, and I was just drawn to go to Hawaii, so I explored the Polynesian cultures for a number of years, and then, for some reason, I was drawn to Peru, so <laughs> here I am. Now, you uh, study, um, uh, one of your main theses is, is obviously uh, the Inca, that's what you've been studying for uh, many, many years. And, you know, what can you tell us about the Inca? How did the Inca start off to begin with? Well, the basic story is that the Inca emigrated from the Lake Titicaca area, most likely Tiwanaku, which is presently in Bolivia, um, or at least the border is just north of, of Tiwanaku. And uh, they emigrated from there about uh, 900 A.D. as a result of a major catastrophic El Nino weather event that lasted 40 years, so they were not able to grow food. And so they um, emigrated up north to what is presently called Cusco. Now, you've done a number of books on the Inca, and uh, it was one of your first books, I believe, was A Brief History of the Inca, From Rise to Regime to Ruin. Um, just tell us a bit about that book as well. Okay, well, that book basically covers the, um, the birth of, of the Inca as a people around Lake Titicaca, their founding of Cusco, and then their fall as a result of contact with the, uh, the Spanish in 1532. So it's basically a time span from 900 A.D. until actually 1533, when they were basically, um, you know, the civilization was crushed by the Spanish. So what, what sort of, you know, amazed you about the Inca civilizations? I mean, what, what, sort, what sort of surprised you about it? Well, the basic thing was the fact that they were the largest... Um, phys or physically the largest civilization in the Americas, stretching from the middle of Chile in the south, north to Colombia, west to the Pacific Ocean, and east into the Amazon. And so, you know, beyond that, I wanted to study how it was that they were able to create such a, uh, you know, a large civilization, and um, that led to the first book. But after that, I started to find out that many of the megalithic structures were in fact not built by the Inca, but are probably thousands of years older than them. So how old are they? 
Well, we're guessing that there were at least two periods, uh, two great civilizations that preceded them, one about 12,000 years ago and the other possibly 24,000 years ago. So they are in relation to you know, what is known as the um, procession of the equinox cycle that uh, lasts 26,000 years, and every, approximately every 13,000 years, the Earth undergoes a major cataclysmic event. So what we believe is that uh, these two civilizations rose and then basically fell as the result probably of some kind of Earth, you know, massive Earth change, yeah. the last one being the end of the Ice Age. So, I mean, who was this other civilization that you just referred to? Well, that, that's, you know, that's basically what I'm still studying. We don't really have much information about them except for the megaliths that were left behind. We don't have real names for them. We've, we've given them uh, the names. The first one we call the Hanan Pacha, which means the high civilization. And then the second is the Uran Pacha, which is the middle civilization. And um, the Inca were the third, called the Ukun Pacha. And those terms are based on the Quechua language. So it seems to us, uh, not just me, but other researchers here and, and farther afield, in, you know, including people like Graham Hancock, who I write articles for, and uh, also Hugh Newman and many different people, um, that it was actually uh, the oldest civilization was the highest, the most sophisticated. And it's been actually, actually a descent since then, with the Inca being the last holders of the great, you know, one could say hidden knowledge. Right, and and have other um, have other researchers looked into what you're now researching? I mean, and, w and what did they they discover if they have? Well, not really. the uh, The main researcher that I know of, at least, is Jesus Gamara, who lives in in Cusco, and he's really only known within the city of Cusco and uh, slightly farther afield. But um, I seem to be in the in the middle of it, uh, more or less, trying to find. Um, you know, the bits and pieces of information that I can from those um, that carry the oral traditions here, but also, you know, basing a lot of, uh, of my fundamental research on Fingerprints of the Gods, for example, by Graham Hancock, and the works of some, you know, some other non-conventional academics. I mean, how advanced, um, you know, was the, the cities uh, that the Inca, I suppose, um, um, uh, inhabited? Well, what it seems is that the, you know, um, the conventional story is that the Inca were forced to migrate north. Um, they found the area, which is now called Cusco, that was inhabited by very primitive people. And uh, the Inca were the great teachers in terms of um, agriculture, metallurgy, basically all the arts and sciences and that their civilization you know sprang from you know from Cusco and you know expanded north south east and west but i'm starting to uh, to feel that the inca actually returned to Cusco and that uh, that there were buildings here that preceded them by again you know 12 to 24 ish thousand years and what they did is they simply moved into them adopted them and then built the city around these ancient structures. Um, and there is evidence outside of Cusco in the Sacred Valley, including Machu Picchu itself. And how perfect were these ancient structures? I mean, I've seen some of the pictures on your website, which we'll give the link for very soon, um, and they just seem to be, have been sandblasted. They're just so smooth. Well, that's what's astonishing. I've been um, talking quite a lot with uh, Christopher Dunn, who wrote the Giza Power Plant, which some people may have uh, have read, and yeah, the technology—they obviously had technology, not necessarily technology as we know it, but um, clearly they had technology uh, technology beyond the conventional thought of uh, that which the Inca had, which were bronze chisels and stone hammers. They seem to have had some kind of ultrasonic machine that was able to cut stone in perfect straight lines, not lasers, because Chris Dunn has, has very strongly uh, debunked the idea that lasers can uh, cut stone. But he believes that some sort of ultrasonic or ultra-high vibrational device was employed in order to have the stones fit perfectly together. 
I mean, again, going back to the Inca, was was there any sort of stories which, um, you know, uh, sort of, you know, came out to say that basically, you know, we did not build these cities, we just inhabited them? Well, that's uh, that's a very good point. If you read the ancient or the you know the old chronicles, the Spanish ones, and also the ones written by the descendants of the Inca. They do say that, uh, for example, Saxe Waman, which is on the hill above Cusco and has the largest uh, stone, some being larger than 120 tons, and again, perfectly fitting together, uh, when the first Spanish arrived and were shocked at the, the scale of construction, uh, they, asked the Inca, <coughs> excuse me, they asked the Inca, did you build these? And they said no. And the same with uh, when uh, the first Spanish went to Tiwanaku, and Pumapunku, uh, they, again, they were astonished by not only the size of the stone, but the incredible accuracy of, of the cutting and smoothing of the surface of this very, very hard stone. And again, the, the local people and the Inca who accompanied them said, no, we didn't build these. These were built long before we existed. So how complex is some of the... Um the, the stone masonry work, I mean, how detailed is it? I mean, I mean, how closely do some of these blocks fit in with each other as well? Well, the most amazing examples are at Pumapunku, which is uh, located on the Tiwanaku site. Um, it's actually, unfortunately, only 5 to 10 percent of the visitors to Tiwanaku see Pumapunku, but um, the level of craftsmanship is absolutely astonishing. It does look like they had electrical or vibrational router-like tools, as well as drill presses that were able to cut perfect uh, channels, smooth uh, perfect flat surfaces, and drill holes into diorite, which is on the so-called Mohs scale from 0 to 10, which is a gauge of hardness of stone, with diamond being 10. These are about 7. Um, so it's, it is, the, to me, it's the most mind-boggling sight I've ever seen in the world. So you're saying that uh, the stones that they're made out from, you know, you can't sort of cut these with, uh, they're not like, you know, soft, soft stone. You can't just um, um, go back into, in, into the technology that they would have, the Inca maybe would have had. Uh, their tools would have been broken, wouldn't they, from some of this hardened stone that you're sort of, de you know, describing here. Oh, exactly. The, you know, the bronze chisels would have, uh, would have bent within two or three strikes. And also the uh, diorite stone was brought from at least 90 kilometers away. So it's not only the accuracy of the workmanship, it's the fact that they were able to move multi-ton stones across, um, you know, nine, at least 90 kilometers distance. Well, well, that's it. I mean, how did they move them? Well, that's, that's one of the big questions. Uh, the conventional answers are really quite... Um, Unfortunately, the you know conventional academic stories are quite I find hilarious because they say that either they used wooden rollers and the fact that there are no trees in the area is one thing, and the other idea is that uh, they were floated across Lake uh, Titicaca on reed boats, and some of these stones are 40 tons, which is the weight of at least 20 automobiles. So there must be a connection with these with these ancient structures and obviously the pyramids because you know we are talking we are talking you know the, the, the sort of same weights and the same sort of sizes um, are, are we not well that's true and of course the you know the red granite from uh, you know that make up a lot of the interior of the uh, the great pyramid and, and other structures comes from Aswan which is 500 miles away um, I'm very thankful to be connected again with people such as Christopher Dunn and also Stephen Mailer, who have, um, Chris has, has been to uh, Egypt at least a few times with his measuring instruments that he uses as an engineer, and Stephen has been visiting um, Egypt for at least 20 years and is a, a major um, student of the oral traditions of the Comitian people who are the true descendants of the great uh, pyramid builders, not the pharaohs. The pharaohs came later. And I'm very fortunate to work with them and others. Um, and in this way, we're, you know, piece by piece putting the, uh, the puzzle back together as to how ancient these places are and, and also the possibility that um, the early, very early Egyptians and the very early Peruvian people were in physical contact with each other um, as 
at least via, you know, major seafaring um, ability. Well, yes, and I suppose, you know, if, if you're going to build something near the coast, surely you've got seafaring ability. Well, that's an excellent point. Uh, the thing is, my the central focus of, of my work now is the area of Paracas, which is just south of Lima by about four hours, and that is where we find these uh, intriguing people who had inc uh, elongated skulls, um, either through... Uh, head binding, or possibly some of them were naturally elongated. And we also find evidence of that at Tiwanaku, that these people also had elongated skulls. And there is some belief that the, uh, that the Inca as well had uh, the same physical feature to some degree. So it's quite possible that um, at least part of the bloodline of uh, the ancient Peruvians came from elsewhere, as well as the fact that we're finding skulls with red hair, and that's very intriguing. And, and what does the red hair mean? Well, a lot of the highest um, civilizations around the world, uh, the priests and the king queens, or the, you know, the priest king families, seem to have had this red hair phenomenon happening um, throughout the Middle East, um, in Egypt, um, of course, you know, in Ireland and and Scotland and also in South America, as well as into the Pacific in, or on Easter Island. And it's thought that the first inhabitants of New Zealand, the people before the Maoris, were these red-haired, tall, light-skinned people, not, ne uh, not necessarily Europeans, but some obscure race who, um, you know, we're still trying to find um, information about, um, about who they were. So... In your research, then, well, actually, let let me ask you. I mean, uh, how did you sort of get into the the elongated skulls? I mean, where did that come from for you? The connection. Well, that's a great point. Actually, the the thing is that I first I saw my first examples in Cusco about five years ago on my first trip, in a very small museum in the basement of the Coricancha, which was the spiritual center of the Inca. There's a small museum, and they have examples of these elongated skulls um, and through uh, through my studies of course with the connections with Tiwanaku I found out that um, many skulls there have been unearthed which had elongated skulls and um, just gradually move, uh, traveling closer and closer to the coast of Peru there's a museum at Ica where they have these monumentally huge ones that have almost twice the cranial capacity of the uh, of a modern human and uh, in Paracas, I met uh, a man who has a small private museum, and he had one on display, and I found out that he had 18 more at home. And so um, he allowed me to not only look at them, but I sort of coaxed him into displaying them at the museum. Um, I was able to take DNA samples from them and ship those samples to Lloyd Pye in the United States, and they're presently being analyzed as to, uh, you know, so that we can find out the... Um, genetic characteristics of who these people were. And do you think you're going to find that? I think so. I think we're looking at two distinct um, types of human. I think the elongation by means of cranial manipulation, as in skull binding, was a later characteristic, and that there are examples of humans that had naturally elongated skulls, and they are the oldest um, of the two groups. But, at, you know, from there, we're very much speculating at this point as to where they came from. Again, we're looking at the characteristics of the red hair um, and other physical features in the skulls themselves, which I've been told by um, some experts are, appear to not be normal human characteristics. So where did this species go then? They basically interbred with normal, you know, quote-unquote normal humans, and so the elongation traits gradually died out. Um, the Paracas people who, who showed the, the greatest um, or the largest elongated skulls over a period of time started to interbreed with the Nazca people, and by the time the Nazca, uh, you know, the makers of, of the, the Nazca lines, once the Nazca civilization reached its peak, the entire elongation characteristic, whether through binding or whether through uh, natural means, 
seems to have disappeared. So it seems to be a genetic trait as well as a cultural trait which, uh, which gradually died out. And were they from this planet? That I don't know. <laughs> um, I hate, you know, I really hate to speculate that they, uh, that they could be, um, you know, that these people are hybrid humans. It, it is possible, but that, it, that is a stretch at this point. Um, Lloyd Pye, who um, some will know from the Star Child Skull, um, you know, the, the Star Child Skull is probably the example of a possible hybrid human. He's very convinced that, um, you know, that these elongated skulls are not from this Earth, or at least some, some of their genetic material is not. So are you saying that the e elongated skull, um, you know, does connect with the sort of monolithic um, structures uh, you know, that, you're, that you've been researching? That's what I and others are starting to believe, that, um, that the megaliths were in fact built by a very ancient cultural, you know, culture of people. Again, you know, we're moving, you know, we've already started talking about... Um, you know, off-world civilizations, and I guess the next one is, you know, Atlantis. So it seems possible that there was a race of ancient beings, very small in number, that survived at least one, if not two, major cataclysms, and they, you know, they fled to some, you know, safe ground, um, it, which seems to be, at least in one example, uh, the Paracas area, and the other example may very well be Egypt, and it's there that they took on the role of the great teachers, and they, you know, they were the constructors of things such as the um, the pyramids at Giza, and also Puma Punku and other, you know, fantastic um, engineering marvels in in the Peru Bolivia area. And, and I suppose for yourself, I mean. It took you a long time to sort of come to this conclusion. You've not just, you know, rushed into this and said, you know, connected dots that aren't there. This is the direction that your research has took you on. Well, it, it has, and again, um, I'm I'm very hesitant about uh, talking of of the the possible. You know, there is of course the possibility that you know it's off planet beings or people or even, you know, quote-unquote Atlanteans, but um, I don't want to jump into that because until we have more evidence, of course, I will be attacked by ev anybody, <laughs> you know, any, anybody and everybody uh, by making such a stretch. But um, it seems to be leaning in that direction, but I, I can't, of course, make any definitive conclusions until we have much more data, especially um, DNA evidence. Well, exactly, and, and I mean, you know, you must find w with saying something like that, or even s some of your research, um, you know, mainstream academia uh, won't always agree with your findings, will it? Oh no, no, they they will, um, you know, they will definitely attack this. And I've I've learned the lessons again that people such as Graham Hancock have learned, where he has been under attack, you know, for decades by academia um, for you know, suggesting the possibility that there, you know, that um, highly evolved cultures existed before the Bible. Uh, but, you know, I think there are so many of us on the, you know, not just academics, but just people um, in general who are starting to very much question our, you know, where it is that we did come from and, and, and think, believing that uh, a, a 6,000 to 7,000 year time span for, um, humanity to be evolved is quite ridiculous. Um, so I'm not, not alone with that, in, including the guests that, that we just had from the United Arab Emirates. They had been to Giza, they had been to Baalbek in Lebanon and other places, and they, you know, they um, completely are convinced that um, we as humans and evolved humans uh, go back many thousand years. So let's just get back to the Inca, and, uh, and one of the cities I want to just discuss with you, um, well, if it was a city, uh, I'll get to ask you that in just a second, was um, Satewaman. Uh, was that a whole city as such? No, the, the general conventional thought is that it was a fortress, but it's um, the local people of oral tradition that I've spoken with here say that it was a... A, you know, it was a great spiritual center, um, and that was its function during the Inca period. 
and also um, far, you know, farther back in time, there there is actually a tunnel which connects Sacsayhuaman with Cusco, which is about two miles long underground. I've seen the end, both ends of it, but uh, both ends have been blocked off so that no one's allowed to access uh, the tunnel. Okay, and at the the peak of its uh, civilization, I mean, how many people would have lived there? Well, in Cusco itself, there were, there were probably 250,000. And the Inca civilization itself, at its peak in 1530, say 1530, was about 10 to 15 million. That's a lot of people. And um, uh, and for its time, you know, again, it was, it was, it was quite civilized. I mean, they even had uh, highways, did they not? Oh, they did. And, and we're starting to find out that the highway system itself preceded the Inca. Uh, the great civilization prior to them were called the Wari, and they were using the, you know, the road system before the Inca existed. And it's quite possible that the main roads, there's one along the coast and another one in, uh, in through the Andes that are more or less parallel to one, to one another going from southeast to northwest, that they could very well be, you know, many, many thousand years old. I mean, you know, that's quite an intelligent design to build that, isn't it? It is, and the and the the amazing thing is that the Pan American Highway, which uh, goes down the coast of Peru to this day, is the Inca Road, as well as the major road that goes through the highlands and the Andes. That that road is the Inca Road that's used by, you know, buses, trucks, and cars. And I mean, how long, uh, how, how sort of far did the uh, the highway stretch at that at that time? Well, it stretched at least from Quito in Ecuador to the north down to about where Santiago um, is in Chile. And um, then the two main roads, which were called the Capacnan, which means royal roads, they were interconnected at many different points, which again are modern, you know, modern day roads. But the whole system is believed to be a total of about 30,000 kilometers. Now, as well, some of these um, uh, road systems, am I right in saying that some of them actually uh, uh, veered off into cliffs as well? Uh, actually, not in the case of, um, of Peru and Bolivia. What happened was that um, some of the roads, in, at least in the highlands and the Andes area, had to cross major, uh, not major valleys, but they had to cross uh, crevasses and ravines and so that's where the Inca were ingenious at building rope bridges, which um, many people will, you know, maybe even remember from Tarzan movies or things like that. These, you know, these amazing spans of 200 to th uh, 300 feet that could carry, um, you know, very heavy weights. Um, there's only one in existence now, which is, be, uh, is rebuilt once a year. But um, during the height of the Inca Empire, there were many of them. Um, and that was actually one strategy that the Inca used in order to slow down the advance of the Spanish was by cutting the, the major um, rope bridges. I see, and also another uh, um, ingenious device they had as well, well, structure they had, was the, the rock terrace. Now, just explain for the audience what they are, and uh, do they still use them as well? Well, uh, yeah, the terracing system in general was probably built by the Inca, uh, not necessarily by the cultures that came before, but they are phenomenal in scale. Um, in the Sacred Valley, for example, which is just uh, east of Cusco, some of them, uh, some of these terracing systems, which average each terrace is separated from the next by, you know, six to eight feet in height, and they go from the valley floor to the tops of mountains. So some of these terraces are you know, up to at least 2,000 feet in vertical height. Um, and the entire, I was just, we were just at Lake Titicaca yesterday, and the entire area of Lake Titicaca, all the hills are terraced, but very few of them are used presently. But it shows that, a, a, you know, a very large population was present at one time. Yeah, absolutely. And, um, you know, is there any sort of myths or legends associated with the Inca science as well? Oh yeah, there are so many, uh, so many of them. Um, but the trouble is that you have to pick through, um, you have to pick through the, you know, the historic accounts of the Spanish versus the oral uh, uh, accounts or traditions of the Inca, 
uh, what I've been trying to do is read as much as possible of all the accounts and, and try to find a central theme or story. Um, yeah, but again, you know, it, it was the first ink or, or the first contact with the Inca where they stated that places such as Sacsayhuaman and um, Tiwanaku and Pumapunku were not built by them, but preceded or were were built by a, a much earlier culture who they didn't e- even have a name for. And again, this earlier culture, um, were there any sort of legends of you know gods living there as well, or gods present present there? Shall I say? Well, the most common theme is that there was a race of giants who lived. Um, they were created by the same creator god uh, called Viracocha, who were the, uh, was the creator of the Inca. And uh, he, uh, Viracocha created this race of giants who were able to build these monstrous uh, megaliths. But then he became, it's very similar to the Bible, he became very unhappy with uh, with them because they started to uh, degrade in terms of ethics and morals, and so he destroyed them by means of a of a great flood. With these the Inca civilization, um, was there any sort of hieroglyphic records on uh, to, to to view, or I mean, was there anything ever in, you know sort of writing that was ingrained in the walls or stuff? Well, that's an actually that's an excellent uh, question, and that's something I'm researching right now because the common story is the Inca had no uh, written language and they you know they only had oral tradition but what we do know for sure is they had a system called quipus which were knotted cords and these were base 10 you know much like what we have as in zero to nine and so by means of tying knots in these cords of different colors they had a very brilliant portable accounting system that was able to be moved you know anywhere within the civilization uh, the the inca were emphatic about keeping records of, of people and houses and the number of llamas that were raised, uh, the you know, volume of crops that were raised in every part of the, of the territory in order um, to be able to distribute the wealth during times of, um, of famine. But what I've also found is that there was a coded language, hieroglyphic in nature, very similar to um, if you look at Mayan or to some degree Egyptian in terms of their symbols inside of squares, um, you know, as you would know, in terms of the Egyptians, uh, you know that that sort of um, block that the uh, that the symbols are inside of are called cartouches. And in terms of the Maya, I, I don't know what the name of that is, but it's like a symbol um, within an an outer shape, either a circle or a square. And so these were. Um, part of the Inca textile system. And it's only because I was able to find a very obscure little book that was written um, here in Cusco. And actually today we, were, we tried to find a copy, but um, the only copy I know of is uh, one that David Hatcher Childress has. Um, and it, it shows the symbols. It, it was a very um, uh, syllable-based um, uh, written language in terms of each syllable was represented by a symbol sort of like the way Japanese is written. So you must find it very difficult then to do your research sometimes because you've not got a lot of text to go on, have you really? No, not at all. And um, But that's, you know, that's the intriguing aspect. I'm, I'm always, you know, given another little clue to, you know, once I feel that I've, you know, learned enough about, uh, about the area, I'm always given a clue which is even much more obscure and much deeper and much more intriguing to follow so i think it will be a, a never-ending process i mean was there any great prophets that prophesied that there is information buried somewhere on these ancient civilizations that apparently made these structures i mean have you heard of anything like that uh not really but um again something that stephen mailer told me you know who has studied in egypt for decades and um much of his information is based on a man called Hakim, who was the expert of on uh, oral traditions who died a couple of years ago. Uh, Hakim basically said that the structure itself is the teacher. So the more that you study the ancient megalithic structures, they reveal the answers. Uh, you know, through geometry, through symbolism, through um, celestial alignments, through composition, um, you know, joinery, 
and things like that. Over, over time, even though there aren't people necessarily alive who, you know, have the full picture, the megalithic, uh, meg megalithic monuments still do have all of the knowledge. It's just a question of repeated uh, trips to them and just, you know, keeping your eyes and mind open. So, so how many times do you go and view the uh, monoliths? Uh, this is my 13th trip to Cusco so far. Um, and each, you know, each trip to each place becomes a deeper investigation. My greatest fear is that I will go to a place such as um, Sacsayhuaman or Oyente Tambo or Machu Picchu and not see something new. But we were uh, at Machu Picchu three days ago, and there were new things that uh, basically revealed themselves to to myself and to and to the to our guests who were were with us. Um, and what are these, some of these the features that are revealing themselves? What, what are you discovering? Well, actually, some of them are, are quite simple. Some of them are quite ob obscure. The, the, um, the simplest one was we climbed the mountain, which is in behind Machu Picchu, because the, if anyone looks at a, at a picture of Machu Picchu, they'll see the, these two hills close right in the background. And they look like the profile of a human, uh, human face looking skywards. And so the highest of the two hills is basically the nose, whereas the lower one is the chin. So we climbed the 1,200 stone stairs to the top of the, what is called Huayna Picchu, and um, at the very peak, uh, there was a stone that had a slot carved into it. And by staring through that slot, that pointed directly to what is called the Inti Punku, which means the sun gate, which is on a distant mountain. And that was um, a ceremonial and also strategic point for restricting access to Machu Picchu. Uh, so that, that was a simple example. Another example is one of my guests, um, when we were uh, cl uh, climbing back up the backside of this mountain, he saw in a small cave these stones uh, that were covered in some kind of white um, ashy or chalky material, and he recognized, or, or he, he didn't know what the symbols were, but they, he said they were carved symbols. So he has taken photographs, which he's going to email me once he gets back to Dubai in a few days so that I can have a look. I mean, wouldn't that be incredible for your research, to, that, that the actual answers do lie in the monoliths themselves, and that as you, you know, carry on this journey that you're on, that you're going to discover something just fantastic, and, and perhaps, you know, they were there all, the, all this time, the answers? I think so, and, but I, you know, I don't think they were left, uh, you know, I don't think the clues are left on purpose. There are those who believe that uh, you know some of these major uh, constructions, such as the you know the Great Pyramids and and so forth, were built so that uh, you know you know as testimonials or or monuments to humanity for us to you know for us during this age to uncover. I think simply that the great builders naturally left clues um, as they were building them, um, and so bit by bit we're starting to discover these, such as um, you know what Chris Dunn has found on the Giza Plateau in terms of obvious, mach you know, machining of very hard stone using what, again, what he uh, believes are ultrasonic um, tools. Um, and some of these stones are, are just, sc you know, scattered in the desert. They aren't necessarily right next to the pyramid or within the, you know, there are, there are features within the Great Pyramid that uh, suggest that as well. But there are also these stones that d just seem to lie around, but it, it, it's taken his engineering eye to be able to see what the average um, visitor would never never notice, such as perfect 90-degree angles or areas where it looks like a, 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 um, a spinning, you know, ball-type cutter has, uh, has cut through the stone to create uh, certain contours. But like you said, only an engineer would be able to recognize that, and uh, with his engineering eye, um, you know, he's picked up on these, on these marks, hasn't he? Oh, yeah. So, uh, it, it, you know, it begs the question then, where did the technology go, th you know, if it was advanced technology, that made these monoliths, where, where has that ended up? Um, because, you know, it doesn't seem that like it's made it into mainstream, uh, mainstream science, uh, because, I mean, our technology only sort of took off in the 40s. So where has this technology come from? Well, that's a good question, and, and that's the, the, the greatest... Um attack uh, that the skeptics can use is they will say, well, okay, you say that, that these were cut or carved by machines, so where are the machines? And uh, we are 
still having difficulty with finding ex- there are examples of components but you know the great ma- machines themselves you know no longer exist um but if you you know if you are talking for example 10,000 years um anything made out of iron would of course uh would have have rusted and decayed to nothing um any components made out of gold would have been <coughs> if they were found by a later you know not as sophisticated culture that any gold or or precious components or you know diamonds or yeah uh, or crystals or anything would have been removed for some other function and so it's quite probable that any of these machines once found by a later culture would have been taken apart and used for different things scattered and you know never never to be found again for example if you took a you know the engine out of an automobile and took the whole thing apart and spread it over over the course of of miles through different villages if one you know if one person has a radiator hose you have <laughs> you know you have something that looks odd but it doesn't give you any indication of of what the what the true function was but um again Stephen Mailer has found certain things in the Cairo museum such as as these plates uh, made of incredibly hard stone which seem to have fin like projections on them and he and others have speculated that those plates are, were part of a machine that spun at incredibly high uh, velocity and possibly were responsible for neutralizing gravity so that the great stones of Giza for example could be moved without you know the conventional story of slaves and rollers and that sort of thing i mean that's very difficult to get your head around though isn't it i mean to uh, to think that there was advanced civilizations on this planet way before ourselves uh, or even uh, you know more advanced than what we are now but when we say advanced do you think we could I- the advancement could it could have been in a very different direction i mean as we understand lasers and stuff like that which you've mentioned before maybe the technology was different in a way that we can't even uh, begin to understand well, I believe so. The you know the little so far that I've been able to study about Giza, I'm hoping to go in in March uh, or April with uh, Stephen Mailer and Chris Dunn to look at uh, at the you know these an- anomalous structures there. Um, it seems that uh, the ancient people didn't impose upon nature or harness nature the way we do. It seems that they had a much higher more highly evolved sense of the natural forces and therefore were able to i wouldn't say nurture the forces but were able to use the natural forces um such as the movement of water such as um electro or magnetics or electromagnetics in a much more you know i wouldn't say simple way but um having a, a higher more highly evolved sense of of how these natural forces worked they were able to utilize them without imposing the way that we um, have a ten like tendency to do yeah so uh, again more advanced in 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 a sort of spiritual nature uh, as well exactly so another uh, um, sort of uh, direction i wanted to take this in as well was the underground tunnels because i understand that you've done some some research into that as well just just tell us about the underground system that that exists there as well well, the, the one tunnel that I've seen the openings to, um, again, are, are, is the one that goes from Sacsayhuaman, which is on a hill right to the north of Cusco, uh, down through Cusco, and under, comes out underneath uh, what is called the Coricancha, which was the spiritual center of the city, which still exists. Um, I've seen the openings, but um, again, they've been blocked up uh, because the government uh, doesn't want people going in and getting lost, but... There are oral traditions of there being tunnels that go from Tiwanaku to Cusco, um, and another site at uh, Lake Titicaca called Amaru Muru, which means the, uh, well, it's an ancient, uh, called the, like the ancient snake door, and that seems to go to Cusco. Um, and there even the, there's even talk of, of ancient tunnels that go from Lima and underneath the Andes into the Amazon, but... Um, Again, these are based solely on stories. I have no actual proof that they exist. But uh, the city of Lima, uh, some people, you know, have uh, been led to believe that Lima was founded by the Spanish in 15, I think, 34. But in fact, it dates back at least 2,000 years, if not older. Uh, there was a culture there that built these huge 
um, pyramids out of adobe, which actually still exist, but they simply look like hills. But in fact, if you walk up uh, close to them, they are made of multiple million mud bricks. It's just uh, mod the modern people who live in Lima don't even give a second thought to them. But, you know, someone from Canada, uh, like me, is <laughs> was completely shocked when I saw the first. <laughs> and then I naturally started looking for more, you know, and then I started to see more of them. Well, what drives you? What are you, what are you searching for? Oh, gee, I guess it's just the, you know, the, it's the basic um, central core question of where do we come from as, as a people. Um, you, know, you know, some people have said, well, it's, you know, it's up to the Inca or the Inca descendants or the, you know, in the case of Hawaii, the Hawaiians, to find this stuff out. But I'm more of a person who looks at humanity as, as a family of people rather than separating us into culture. So, I, you know, I, I simply am fascinated by the history of humanity and uh, where we come from as a species and what is it that we've lost. Um, because that gives us, a, you know, to find the answers gives us the true essence of who we are as, as beings. And what do you think we have lost? I think we've lost the majority of our history. Um, you know, we've had, at least in the Western world, this, you know, this one doctrine which um, for some people has, you know, has been forced upon them, which is the Bible, or for others there would be other texts, um, and, you know, the trouble with those is that the farther back in time you go, the more obscure it is because we aren't given timelines. And so they say approximately, you know, 6,000 years ago, Adam and Eve, you know, existed or, or you know, or 10,000 or something or whatever. But the story is so illusory and so fragmented that it doesn't give us a clear picture of um, humanity's origins. And... I come from a scientific background, and to some degree, I do believe in evolution. But I am actually one who, you know, who believe is open to the possibility that there, you know, of interaction with, uh, you know, other life forms um, the, from not of this planet. The fact that we may have certain gen uh, genetic traits which are not from here. Um, but but, but as the, a, as the a major. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. Well. The, well, just, you know, I, I don't know. It's just there's so little we know. And whenever some of these um, these places show up, such as, um, you know, the, the latest ones in Turkey, which have been dated uh, clearly at 12,000 B.C., or the fact that the Sphinx has been dated, um, thanks to Dr. Robert Schock, at being at least 8,000 years, if not 12,000 years old, that um, initially uh, the, you know, the mainstream academics, you know, just shun the idea, but as we're able to bring more experts in, such as, um, you know, geologists, engineers, etc., who can prove the antiquity of certain sites, it shows that we go back much farther in time than we have, you know, traditionally been told. So what was a key point for you then to sort of, you know, connect this whole um, idea that perhaps we've been helped in some way? Uh, by by a race that wasn't initially from this planet. I mean, wh where do you, where does that s stem from? Well, I don't really have you know that strong of that strong or you know I don't have that strong a belief in, in it. Um, no, but I've as, heard as, many as an stories. idea, as an idea that it, it's a possibility. Oh, well, to... uh, well, the possibilities I've heard in you know the the strongest sense I've I've learned is through the origin traditions or, or oral traditions of many different people, such as the Hawaiians, um, some Native American people, some people from uh, Indonesia, uh, the Inca and others, that the little cluster of um, stars we call the Pleiades seems to be a source of ancestral um, genetic, uh, DN, you know, genetic um, content as well as uh, tradition. Um, so that's that's about as strong as, you know, as I can go with it. I'm, I'm not a great UFO, you know, buff. You know, I, I don't deny that they could exist, but I'm, I'm not going to say yes, they do, even though I have had sightings. You know, I'm, I still, you know, I'm still, I keep, try to keep myself firmly on a scientific, um, you know, foothold. Uh, because yes. I don't want to go drift off and, you know, either sound like, you know, sound like a lunatic. Um, but it's, <laughs> it's, it's quite easy to do on, on certain occasions. Um, but there's there, and also, 
also serious um, you know the, the serious area uh, seems to be very important too as well as possibly Orion they are the three that seem to come up over and over again as being you know the source of, of, um, of, of you know, the so-called ancient ones or where the great uh, you know the great high kings go when they die they they go to the heavens you know they return their spirit returns to some ancient homeland in the sky and quite often it's specifically the Pleiades or Orion or Sirius okay and uh, one of my sort of final questions with, with um um, uh, the Incas was, um, you know, I mean, obviously I grew up with movies. We've all uh, watched the movies of the Inca, and um, uh, you know, they seemed to, at some points to be quite a savage race. You know, with with the sort of human sacrifices. But would you tend to say that the whole thing with the human sacrifices it was very minimal? Well, that yeah, that is actually completely untrue, and that's based again on on you know extensive research. Um, the only peoples that I know of in the Americas in general were the Aztec who were very much into human sacrifice about the time that um, Cortez arrived. Um, that's, you know, there is evidence for that, but the earlier people, the Maya, who lived slightly farther south, um, they, again, they have been accused of being, uh, you know, of, uh, of having major human sacrifice and the Inca as well, but a lot of that is based on the church manipulating the stories of history in order to debase history so that the descendants of these people would be much easier to, con uh, to convert into that new faith that they brought with them. Uh, but amongst the Inca, there are you know, possibly, you know, I've only heard of, I think, six or possibly ten examples of, of human sacrifice. Uh, you know, not hundreds or thousands. And I believe the same is true amongst the Maya. They've been accused of being, uh, you know, very, you know, great in terms of, uh, or horrific in terms of human sacrifice. But the, the, the only documented cases of the, in, uh, sorry, of the Aztec, because their culture was actually in trouble at the time that the Spanish arrived, and so it's believed that the Aztecs were um, sacrificing human hearts in order to appease um, such gods as the rain god to bring uh, to bring rain back. And uh, also amongst the Nazca, the, the Nazca were a culture that collapsed, I believe, about the seventh century A.D. And because of a drought, they sort of lost their you know, lost their wits to some degree or lost their sense of humanity, and they started to get involved heavily in human sacrifice, again, because of a major earth change that stopped the rains. And so in order to appease the rain god, they uh, performed human sacrifice on quite a, you know, quite a large scale. Well, uh, Brian, I found your work to be absolutely fascinating, and we're uh, at the top of the hour right now. So uh, do you have a Facebook page and a YouTube channel where people can get hold of you? Yes, I do. Actually, my Facebook page and my YouTube channel, uh, it's just you have to write uh, Brian Forrester with the correct um, spelling. Brian is B-R-I-E-N, and um, Forrester is F-O-E-R-S-T-E-R. -E uh, and so my, my latest um, two websites, one is www.brianforrester.com, and the other one is Visit Paracas. Uh, v i s i t p a r a c a s dot com, and that covers basically uh, the new information that I'm working on. Okay, and you also do the uh, tours over there, don't you? You do archaeological tours. Yes, exactly. That's my company called uh, Hidden Inca Tours, which is www dot hidden inca tours dot com, and that's where you'll find all the. Not only the information about the, the tours we give, but um, I have 530 YouTube videos so far, hundreds of photographs, and a lot of the information on the site is not solely for, you know, selling people tours. It's also just to present information to the public about the, the history of, of uh, Peru and uh, Bolivia. Well, Brian Foster, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. Thank you.
To find out more information on Brian Foster, just go to my website, themoreshow.co.uk, and look up Brian Foster under Past Guests. And don't forget you can follow us on Facebook and Twitter to get the latest updates on the shows. Now, also, we have a TV show which transmits on Sky 201 and FreeSat 403 every Friday from 6 p.m. So until next time, thanks for listening. If you like what you watch, then don't forget to follow us on Facebook and Twitter for the latest updates on The More Show. Remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel for new weekly television and radio shows.